Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today, Tim. I hope everyone out there who's listening are doing as fantastic as well. But before we get to this incredible mystery, this really tragic and bizarre story, Tim, how are you? I'm doing all right. Thanks a lot for asking. Yeah, this is a really interesting case that we are covering today. It is about the unsolved murder of Sarah Hunter from Manchester, Vermont. And this research was brought to us by Kathleen Studer. Big thanks to Kathleen. We've been covering a lot of cases from New England, Vermont, and New Hampshire, of course, uh, lately. And that's because of our new podcast, Dark Valley. And this case took place during a similar time period to the cases in Dark Valley. So this is another one that we're just trying to unpack before we go any further with the podcast Dark Valley. Yeah, it's a good point. And as we've been working on Dark Valley and Jennifer Amell, who's taken the lead on that, as she's been investigating, working with family members, working with Jane Borowski, the last surviving attack victim of the Valley Killer, we've started to identify these other individuals who have these stories that are kind of similar to the ones of the people that Jen and Jane have been looking into for the focus of Dark Valley, the podcast. So in a sense, we've kind of unintentionally been expanding this Dark Valley universe and decided that it was important to tell these stories as well. They might not be related to the Valley killings, but they are no less tragic and important to talk about. Absolutely. And we're going to get into Sarah's case in just a little bit. But before we do, just want to let you know about Missing Premium. If you want our episodes ad free and sometimes early, sign up for Missing Premium now on Apple Podcasts. If you're not an Apple user, you can go to missing.supportingcast.fm and sign up for the same product there. You also get our weekly bonus show, Lance. And of course, those ad free episodes are bundled with Crawl Space and Dark Valley. So that's all ad free. And one more quick thing, we are organizing private investigations for the missing. We're doing the first 5K fundraiser run slash walk that's going to be taking place on Sunday, October 8th, Reading, Massachusetts. If you want to register for that, you get a t-shirt, you get an entry into the raffle where you could win one of the many really cool raffle prizes that we're organizing. You can go to piftm.org slash run and you can register there again all proceeds go to the great nonprofit private investigations for the missing okay we'll see you there and we'll see you after this quick commercial break but don't forget to follow us on social media at missing csm we'll be right back Sarah Lewis Hunter was born April 13th, 1954, as the youngest of five siblings. She was the baby of the family. And she grew up in Camden, Maine, went to college in Pennsylvania, and moved to Vermont in 1982. Sarah was a really unique individual. She was very accomplished in golf. She became an LPGA certified professional. And she worked between Florida and Vermont. She was actually Vermont's first female golf pro. She married another golf pro. They divorced in 1985, but they were married for five years. And I just think that all of this is really such an achievement. I don't know about you, Tim. I was the baby in our family, too, with two older sisters. Me, too. With right. One, yeah. one older sister. But could you imagine being the baby of the family with five older siblings? That's. It feels like, don't you have to like stand out? Either you stand out to this like incredible level or I feel like you have to endure a lot if you're the baby of five siblings but then again like you've also seen them learn their lessons I don't know I just love that family dynamic yeah me too on one hand it seems like you'd have more protective presence around with uh, your siblings and your parents of course Um, but also you got to forge your own path you know and I think the babies uh, of families feel that right right don't you feel like there's like some tough love that's in there too. Like your older siblings can pick on you, but God forbid if if you get picked on by somebody outside the family. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So they, you know, they can apply that tough love. And I feel like not to generalize like New Englanders, but I feel like that's pretty common in, in 
you know, a state that has, uh, <laughs> it's going to sound cheesy, but a lot of chores. You know, you, you, you snow shovel, you rake leaves, you, you mow the lawn, like you do a lot of stuff. And with her being the golf pro that she was, I, I feel like she went through that gauntlet of tough love. And that's something that she might have applied to the lessons that, would, that she taught professionally. Yeah, I could see that. And uh, she also was known for a weekly golf clinic that she did for youth, which is great because she had a passion for uh, teaching the younger kids golf. And in 1986, she started her first year as head golf professional at the Manchester Country Club just north of Manchester, Vermont, after several years of working as an assistant. So that's pretty impressive. At 32 years old, she is the head golf professional at the Manchester Country Club, which is something that she apparently had worked her way up to become. Again, just really speaks to that character and that sense of uh, desire to accomplish. And for those who don't know, Manchester is a small town in the southwest area of Vermont. It's tucked between the Green Mountains and the Taconic Mountains. And in 1990, the population of Manchester was 3,774 per the 1990 census. And it has a really rich history, not unlike many New England towns, with a historic home once owned by Robert Todd Lincoln, who was Abe Lincoln's son. And following the Civil War, it became an affluent resort area. And Tim, have you ever fly fished? Absolutely not. Yeah, I tried fly fishing for one summer, and I got really good at untangling knots. That was the extent of my fly fishing. And if anyone out there is an avid fly fisher, they will know the name Charles Orvis. And in 1856, Charles Orvis began his fly fishing tackle business there, which is now the oldest sporting goods mail order retailer in the United States. And this area of Vermont is also known for America's first wrongful conviction homicide case, the Bourne Colvin case that went on from 1812 to 1819, which I had not heard of. And uh, we won't go too deep into that here today, but uh, maybe something something interesting to take a look at uh, in the future. You did mention that the population in 1990, which was around the time of Sarah's story, was 3,774. You did mention that uh, as of the 2018 census, it really hasn't grown that much. 4,258, which I don't know what that says about the town. Yeah, I guess it's a small area, I think, geographically. Yeah. Yeah. And by September of 1986, Sarah was finishing up the golf season in Vermont and had just made a down payment on a condominium in Manchester and was planning a vacation that fall. And here's really where Sarah's story starts, where we're going to get into all of the circumstances of her murder. On Thursday, September 18th, 1986, she left that job, she left work, and stopped by to spend some time at a friend's house. So the time frame here is important. She headed for home from that friend's house at 8 p.m. because she had to prepare for the Pro-Am golf tournament the following day in Bennington, Vermont, which is about 25 miles south of Manchester. So 8 p.m., she leaves her friend's house. And then... Early the next morning on September 19th, 1986, an employee of the Sitco station off Route 7A notified police about a 1984 beige Nissan in the alleyway behind their building that seemed out of place. And you can see here in the picture, we'll post it on social media, but yeah, this uh, this car is um, really kind of just wedged between the garage and a wall. Yeah, no way anybody is opening up the doors especially the driver's side and the passenger side they might be able to open up the back door maybe a few extra inches because it's about halfway exposed there was only about two inches of clearance on either side between the car wash and what looks to be a stone wall that leads up into some uh, forest area so interesting that this car is pulled in not backed in it's pulled in and no real exit uh, obvious exit from the car is available unless you go through the window on the passenger side or maybe squeeze yourself out the back door. Yeah, it's unclear if the windows are open because in the picture we're looking at, uh, you can really only see the back uh, windows that seem closed. I am confused by looking at the picture because I don't know how the person who put it there got out of the vehicle, assuming yeah. they were in there. Actually, I considered the probability of them putting it in neutral and pushing it in. I agree. But from what we've looked over here with the research, there's nothing that says that the car was in 
any other gear other than park. It doesn't even say what gear the car was in. So it could right. have been in neutral and just kind of hanging out there. Hmm. And police showed up to the scene and ran an inquiry for the vehicle. And, of course, it returned to Sarah Hunter. And when they tried to locate Sarah, who was normally very punctual and responsible, they discovered she did not show up for work or the tournament. Right, which makes no sense at all, considering this was something that was pretty much her entire life. And she was there. So the police interviewed employees of the Mini Mart where the car was found, and she was seen there Thursday evening around 8.30. So she left her friend's house at 8 p.m. and was seen there at 8.30 buying a six-pack of beer. And this was the last known location. And days went by with no sign of Sarah. And two weeks after she went missing, there was a $15,000 reward posted for her, but not a single solitary tip was called in. So $15,000 back in 1986 adjusted for today is just under $42,000. So a pretty significant reward that no one came forward with even a tip. That's really surprising to me that there wasn't one person out there in in that area that saw that, that even if they had the tip or not, if it was legit or not, didn't attempt to collect $15,000 adjusted for today. So the equivalent of over $40,000. And at this point, investigators brought in dogs and helicopters to assist with the search. And they even got assistance from the state police and FBI. Which they asked for. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Manchester being a small town and all. I wonder what it was that convinced the FBI to come in to investigate this so quickly. How was it that this was presented to them, I wonder? Maybe it was her relationship with the golf tournaments across state lines, the potential that that might have been a consideration or something. But at this point, it's so early in the investigation, they agreed to come in. Again, yeah, I appreciate that as well. I'm just wondering how the local law enforcement presented it to the FBI. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder maybe maybe more of a resources question or yeah. possibly the behavioral science unit. But yeah, it seems a little early for that as well. Unless it had something to do with the Valley Killings. Maybe they were connecting it to the Valley Killings and, you know, maybe. And it was reported that fingerprints were found on Sarah's car. And here's something that's really, really strange. When her room at the home that she rented in Manchester Village was searched the police found one can of beer, the same beer that she had purchased, but the rest of the six-pack she bought Thursday night was found in her vehicle. Yeah, that, that is that is strange. And when we were going through this research and that detail came up, I thought to myself, well, that could just be the beer that she drinks. And it's a coincidence that she bought a six pack of the same beer and kind of makes sense, but maybe she had one in the fridge and she bought a six pack. But then the other detail that complements this detail is that the rest of that six pack was in the car. So five other beers were in her car and one beer was missing. And by all accounts, that's the beer that's in her apartment. Right. And the Mart that sold her the beer closed at 9 15 PM that night. And employees didn't notice anything out of place until they found Sarah's car there the next morning. So if we're breaking down this timeline, Sarah left her friend's house at 8 PM, bought the beer at 8 30 PM at this Mart. Then the Mart closed about 45 minutes later. Sarah's car was not there, was not tucked you know, in the alleyway at that point. That they saw. Right. I think they probably would have seen it. I think it's fair to assume they would have seen it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess then we're left to believe that Sarah drove back to her house, opened a beer herself in her her room, and then went back. I'm very confused at this point. Yeah, me too. Uh, To be clear, it doesn't say whether or not the beer had been opened either. This could be a beer that was found empty next to her couch. It could be a beer that's found full in the refrigerator. I think where my head went to first was that there was an empty can of beer here, but that wasn't specified. And I don't know what that building looked like back in 86 when this happened. Maybe they didn't see the car if they left the building and the entrance and exit was... Uh, facing away from that area. Because when you look at the street view of it in 2022, 
there's an entrance that if you were to leave, you wouldn't see like it's on the opposite side of where the car would be. So I could see maybe if that entrance still existed, if that was like the original one. I, I don't think there's a, a good possibility of this because then there's just more action within that 45 minutes and then there's this car that's wedged. I don't know if it actually hit the wall or the side of the, apparently a car wash, uh, which was in yeah. that building there. So I don't know. The fact that it says that they didn't notice anything out of place tells me that uh, they probably would have noticed that or at least they felt like they would have noticed that. Yeah, because they found it the next morning. Yeah, but it doesn't. It would make much more sense if they just didn't see it and something happened right there very quickly. But on October 4th, 1986, two teenage boys riding their bicycles along Brook Road near Danby, Vermont, discovered Sarah's purse placed on a rock by the side of the road. And Danby's about 14 miles north of where Sarah was last seen. So there had to be some transportation here somewhere along the way. And there's really no way to determine how long that purse had been there. So this is October 4th, and Sarah was last seen on September 18th. So a few weeks later, the purse was soaking wet due to a recent rain. So again, no real way to determine how long it had been there. And as you said, Danby is 14 miles north of where Sarah was last seen. So she was renting the place in Manchester Village, not very far from the store. And the purse was found on the rock, placed as if it was to be found, not tossed into the woods as if, like, somebody's car was going along and just discarding evidence. This seemed like it was placed there intentionally to be found. I don't know what this really speaks to, but the distance... That Danby is from where Sarah was last seen, 14 miles. You know, she was f- living in Manchester Village, so right around the same area. Did that happen later on? Does a per- is a person from that area, and then they just went far enough out? You know what I'm saying? You know, they 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 went far enough out, so it looked a little bit more removed, crossed over town lines. Very strange. Do you, do, do does this speak to like maybe he knew her? Or, or the person knew her? And this discovery led to many searches in Danby, but nothing more of Sarah was found until Thanksgiving Day, 1986, and that's November 27th. A Pollitt Vermont family was walking their farm off of the Danby Pollitt Road on Thanksgiving Day when their adult son noticed a body in the brush at the edge of their cornfield. Okay, so it seems like everything is coming back to this Danby area. So her body is unfortunately discovered on Thanksgiving, which was November 27th, which was over two months after she disappeared. And and the area, this cornfield, was only accessed by a long gravel driveway out of the way for a stranger not familiar with the area to use. So the implication there is that this person knew the area. Yeah, I think that's that's safe to say. But how well did they know the area? Is this, a, is this someone who had been planning on doing something, abducting somebody and, and dumping them somewhere so they were casing back roads and they found this area? Or is this somebody who was like, you know, a worker who would commonly access that area? So not trying to implicate anybody specifically, but the implication is whoever did this at some point became familiar with the area. Yeah, I would say familiar with both areas, too, um, right. where where Sarah went missing and where her car was found, and then the Danby area where Sarah's purse was found and then Sarah's body was found. Um, so, yeah, I would say someone very local to the area. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. And an autopsy was performed, and she was quickly identified as Sarah Hunter. And the medical examiner determined that Sarah had died of asphyxiation due to strangulation. And she had also been sexually assaulted. And here's where the speculation comes into play about Sarah being one of the victims of the Connecticut River Valley serial killer or simply the Valley killer. The Brattleboro Reformer in 1987 
reported that police were speculating that as well, that Sarah could be the sixth victim of what appeared to be a serial killer responsible for five deaths along the New Hampshire-Vermont border. Yeah, and the news media started calling him the Connecticut River Valley serial killer, also just known as the Valley Killer, as you said. And in 1987, news was not covering Sarah alone, and I find this very unfortunate because she was always grouped as part of these homicides, possibly related to one or more serial killers. And the Vermont Attorney General's Office took over the investigation, and they were coordinating, looking into any connections with the other murders. And there were 10 murders total that they investigated, looking for similarities. And the cases attributed to the Valley Killer were all violent stabbings, but due to the proximity of Sarah's murder to the others, she hadn't been ruled out as a potential victim of that serial killer or others, but obviously, as we noted, Sarah was asphyxiated and strangled to death. Correct. So we know that the Valley Killer's MO was the use of a knife and these violent, frenzied attacks. And through Jen's work in Dark Valley, additional information has come out about more specific details of how the person would stab and ultimately kill their victims. There was never any sexual assault either with the Valley Killings. Right whereas Sarah was positively sexually assaulted. And there were numerous news articles in Vermont and New Hampshire in 1987 regarding all the agencies coming together to try to solve these cases. And the lead investigator on Sarah's case even stated that he was, quote, confident that we will solve it, end quote. Ever want to jinx a case? Just say you're confident you'll solve it. I know, right? That harkens back to uh, Maura Murray's case, of course, when the prosecutor said there was a 75% chance that that was going to be solved. And that was way back in 2006, I believe, or 2007. Yep. I mean, I guess they don't say when, so. Right. And two years after Sarah went missing in October of 1988, a new suspect came into the public's awareness. This one's interesting. The lead investigator in the case took a flight to California to check out a man that had been arrested for kidnapping and sexual assault over there. And investigators in California had looked into this individual's background and determined that he had, in fact, spent time in Vermont. So they sent a teletype to the local agencies advising them of California's case, which is really interesting to hear back in 1988 how things were communicated across the country. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, Sheila Shepard's unsolved murder because uh, those investigators mentioned teletype as well as sort of being uh, state-of-the-art back then in 1980. Yeah. Um, So they're still using that here in 1988. At least there's some effort to um, link crimes in different jurisdictions. I feel like all too often there isn't really that effort. Yeah, and again, you had mentioned... With the inclusion of the FBI, maybe it had something to do with manpower and resources. So maybe the community here in Manchester was so small. They had not a lot of crime, not a lot of murder. So they had a lot of attention, whether it was a very small group of investigators, but at least a lot of attention was being put on it, magnified a little bit or a lot by the press now gaining traction with this Valley Killer. So that sort of all coupled together... Yeah, again, very impressive that they made the efforts to communicate with an organization all the way across the country. Absolutely. But at the time, the Vermont police were not able to find probable cause to charge this person with Sarah's murder, even though he is allegedly considered a prime suspect. Sarah's case goes cold. Right. I guess it's kind of tough to come up with probable cause when this seems like, not to lessen it, but a random abduction. You know, maybe he had stalked her for a little bit and she didn't realize it, but to place probable cause on what is essentially, again, a a, a random attack. That's a challenge for them. And then 24 years after the news of the new suspect, on July 2nd, 2012, police called for a press conference about the new information in Sarah's murder. And they announced they planned to charge David Allen Morrison with murdering Sarah. And David Morrison was the man they flew to California in 1988 to interview, but didn't have enough at the time to charge him. And Morrison had spent the last 24 years in custody in California, where he had pled guilty to the kidnapping and sexual assault and attempted murder of a Chula Vista woman, which sounds like a harrowing experience for that survivor. And he was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison for that crime. Man, could you imagine being that survivor? And I don't know if this person learned of Sarah Hunter later on, if at all, but just 
coming to grips with the fact that, yeah, the the attack was brutal and traumatizing. Amazing that this person survived. Yeah. Considering what this individual is capable of doing. Well, if I'm not mistaken, and I, I learned this from the documentary on Sarah Hunter's case, it's called overtaken by darkness i believe she jumped out the window of a moving car that morrison was driving so um definitely a harrowing experience for that survivor so since the original investigation there have been obviously advances in crime scene investigation technology nine hairs were found in morrison's car back in 1986 and it came back with a 99.9 percent probability of it being sarah's the hairs were a mitochondrial match to sarah's sister's hair so super impressive captivating yeah yeah, yeah slam dunk right And Morrison had been interviewed on October 9th, 1986, as well as on January 30th, 1987, in regards to Sarah's murder investigation. And he was interviewed in 2009 by a California detective about another abduction case there, which he denied involvement. But when asked by that detective about Sarah's murder, he did not deny killing Sarah per this affidavit. That's amazing. And I just want to revisit the nine hairs here. And I just want to give props to the investigators for realizing in 1986, I know there was some technology back then, but we've looked at cases in that time period and we've seen the crime scenes be mishandled to maybe put a a lighter criticism on it. So these crime scenes were mishandled or not properly handled. I just want to give props to the investigators here for identifying that just a few strands of hair are important and it was also revealed that morrison had been working the evening of september 18th 1986 of course that was the night that sarah went missing he was working at a gas station 170 feet from the sitco station that sarah bought beer at and plans were made to extradite morrison back to vermont Kind of starts putting the puzzle pieces into place, doesn't it? It doesn't say what exactly his job was at the gas station across the street, whether he was pumping gas or whether he was working the counter. But at some point, if this is the individual, he sees her go into the other gas station. He must, right? So that's one puzzle piece that falls into place. But what happens to her car? You know, does does her car end up at the other gas station until he sees that gas station is closed and he brings it back over there's still no connection to the can of beer being in her apartment unless he knew where she lived and went back to her apartment after assaulting her or maybe they both went back but anyway yeah i know it it, the timeline here the actual mechanics of how this worked if this is morrison um are very confusing to me um, and I did watch that documentary by filmmaker Dwayne Carlton. It's called Overtaken by Darkness. You can check it out on YouTube. It is good. It's very informative. It's got a lot of interviews with friends and um, potential witnesses, even the boys that found Sarah's purse. And also a little bit of John Philpin in there. If you're curious to see how John Philpin, the criminal profiler who's featured heavily in Dark Valley, The person who originally solved the Gary Schaefer murders in that area worked tirelessly on the Valley killings. He's also featured in this as well. Very interesting to see him sort of in person and and how his process works. And some interesting information that came out of that documentary was more information about where David Morrison resided at the time of Sarah's murder. Apparently, he resided in Arlington, Vermont, which is eight miles south of Manchester and 23 miles south of Paulette, Vermont, where Sarah's body was found. So strangely, the opposite direction from where Sarah's body was dumped. Yeah, and I wonder if that was an attempt to mislead, to get the body as far away from the location as possible. Yeah, I would say so. And it seems like David drove around a lot. And actually, here's a an excerpt from the documentary. It's a, it's a quote from John Philpin's notes from his interview with David Morrison's father. Quote, David did a lot of driving around the roads. I'm sure he would have known it, meaning the area. He loved to drive and drive and drive and drive, end quote. So... A lot of driving in David's life. And he was also accused of abduction and rape in 1981 in Bennington, Vermont and Lanesboro, Massachusetts. So again, a lot of driving 
If you uh, are listening to Dark Valley, you know Massachusetts comes up a little bit as well. This is all right in that same time period. And there's a really haunting statement that David made to Detective Leonard Miranda of the Chula Vista Police Department. This was made in December of 1988, uh, where he said, I don't intend on harming them girls, but things just go bad. I'm like a car without a driver not in control. So it's interesting that this was around the time of his 20-year-to-life sentence for that attack on this woman who escaped. And he doesn't specify the one woman. He he specifies girls. Yeah, he says them. That's obviously more than one. And uh, David had no real alibi. He claims he closed the gas station at 10 p.m. and went home gave an inconclusive polygraph, and then he left the area. And Sarah's friend, Todd McIntosh, was considered a suspect initially. And he had reported in this documentary that he was being followed by police, and very, very aggressively as well. And he was taken for a polygraph, and he says that the police were in his face all night trying to get him to confess to Sarah's murder. Of course, this is before Morrison was introduced as a suspect. I mean, on the one hand, you got to hand it to the police for being as uh, I mean, aggressive as they were. You know, they wanted to get a confession. But the other hand, you know, if this guy didn't do it, he didn't do it. You know, he's he's not going to make a false confession. And he withstood that. So that does speak a lot. And he is charged with first degree aggravated murder. So a trial was scheduled and then pushed out so that Morrison's attorney could have more time to review all of the evidence. Then. Shockingly, in February of 2015, the case was hit with this bombshell. The charges against David Morrison were dismissed. And they were dismissed because it was determined that an investigator made a substantial error in evidence submission. Wow. So we go back to the hairs from the car. Yeah, apparently the hairs that were entered into evidence as found in Morrison's car and sent for examination where they determined it belonged to Sarah was actually located from evidence vacuumed from Sarah's vehicle, not Morrison's vehicle. And this is a pretty big error, and it led the prosecutors to ask that charges be dismissed as further investigation should be warranted rather than moving forward with the case in court. Now, it just makes me wonder if this was something that was actually a mistake. How did that mistake happen? Again, giving them some props earlier for identifying that hair was important in this investigation, but was this something where the wrong thing was written on a piece of paper taken from Morrison's car as opposed to vacuumed from Hunter's car? Where does that drop in communication happen? Uh, You don't want to think that this was done intentionally, that that they wanted to make sure that this guy went away for this and they could close uh, the books on it, but... It was a significant enough human error for the case to be dismissed, which was devastating. And Morrison was sent back to California to serve out his remaining time there. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And years pass as David Morrison fights extradition until he was finally brought back to Vermont Almost 30 years since Sarah's murder. So as of now, currently 2023, there hasn't been any reported movement in Sarah's case. And the question still remains, is David Morrison responsible for Sarah's murder? Uh, I don't think we believe Sarah is a victim of the Connecticut River Valley killer, but you never know. So that question still looms out there. Yeah, I do think Morrison is likely guilty of of Sarah's murder. Um, And the documentary goes to lengths to suggest so as well. And um, John Philpin in that documentary mentioned that while, yes, the hairs were were incorrect in, in evidence, apparently scent dogs reacted to Sarah being in Morrison's car. Apparently six cars were lined up and the dogs reacted to Morrison's car and... Per John Philpin in that documentary, it was clear to the investigators that Sarah was in his car. Yeah, and just a little personal speculation on this based on the research that we've done in that documentary. Uh, Maybe this is more on like the common sense train of thought, but when they had aggressively interrogated her friend 
and determined that he was not the individual. And you have this other individual who was sentenced to 20 years in life for an attack that had very similar MO to it, sexual assault, possible strangulation, and then the proximity of this person, proven proximity, to where Sarah's car was found, where she was last spotted, as well as the fact that he didn't have an alibi for the night. So again, this is all circumstantial. This is all me going down a speculative path of of thought. But in a small community like Manchester, which we've mentioned several times, there's nobody else. There's no one else that we've heard other than the one that they originally aggressively interrogated and then determined that he was not the person. Yeah, I mean, someone is is killing people in that area. Um, I think fear really gripped the the towns, the surrounding towns of uh, around Manchester after Sarah's body was found. And um, I think doubling back on question you asked earlier about the FBI, I think you're probably right that the serial killings of the Valley Killer were was was probably what the FBI was doing in this case trying to make sense of whether Sarah was a victim of that same unknown serial killer or not. It's also striking to point out the murders in that area that, that are unsolved. Like there's some, at least some bad person or bad people in that area um, that have never been caught. Yeah. Well said. And we were talking about it before about just this grip of fear, like you said, that these community members had. Because all of a sudden, you have a small community, a quiet community, and someone you know is likely a killer. You've you've probably seen this person around in a, in a community that's just a couple, a few thousand in population. You've probably seen this individual, and then you have media outlets printing headlines like serial killer, you know, the word serial killer, which was relatively new at the time to to most people so you have to look up that like serial killer someone who's killing people systematically in your community and you probably have seen this person so yeah there's a big grip of fear there and really unique situation for law enforcement to be in it is and i just want to uh go back over these mechanics of of sarah's abduction and and murder um because it, it still doesn't really make any sense to me it makes more sense after having gone through the story but if it was Morrison, then I think a big part of that puzzle is kind of in place because you, you could suggest uh, or assume that the proximity was so close that he could have seen her enter that store, walk out, possibly attack her. Maybe he's abandoning his own gas station if he's doing that right at that point, though. I mean, so part of it is still confusing and then the beer can, having gotten back to the room that Sarah was renting, makes no sense, too, because part of me thinks, well, did the killer go back to her house? But that makes way less sense than if she did. But if that's what happened and Sarah returned home and then went back out, what are the chances that Sarah's car ends up at that store? Oh, oh, yeah, I've been rolling that around in my head for a long time. If she's abducted before she's able to get to her car and she's carrying the bag that has a six pack of beer. And then he takes her back to her apartment and leaves one beer can there and then puts the, you know, brings her back to her car and puts the six pack back in or, or was the, that one beer can taken from her car? Maybe Sarah ran back out, you know, I mean, th that must be, that must be what happened, honestly, like that, that Sarah left the beer there, ran, ran in real quick and ran back out to her car. I mean, I, I can't make sense of this, though, because how would Morrison know where she lived, you know? And then if she's only renting a room, that implies there's other people in the house, too. You'd think there wasn't some big struggle or something like that. And, you know, there's no reports of Sarah knowing Morrison. So it's, it's not like uh, they probably just met right there and then went to her place like that didn't happen. I, I highly doubt that happened, you know? Yeah, not considering that she had the tournament to prepare for the next morning, uh, I don't really see her as somebody who's partying the night before. No, and Morrison is technically still on the clock at this point at the gas station. You mean for the timeline? Yeah, unless yeah. she le she went home and then left, then he might have been out of work. If she went home, took the beer inside her room, and then I guess went back outside to her car to maybe she forgot something or maybe... She needed to pick something else up, or maybe she was bringing that beer to a different friend's house. I mean, I really don't know, but that's the only thing that makes sense in my head. 
Yeah. And Longshot is like, did he do this to throw the investigation, to confuse the investigation? Like, abduct her, take her to that area in Danby, commit the act, go back to her car, take the beer, the six-pack, take one can from that, and because he has her purse, he knows where she lives from her license, and places that beer can in her apartment. I don't think there's any way that he could have snuck in with one beer like that. I would suggest that it's an error in evidence collecting before I think it's Morrison going into her house with that beer. So that's a great point. Maybe this was some sort of error in collecting evidence. As we've seen with the hair, maybe there was some sloppy investigation that was done. And this could be a case where like the can of beer was there, but maybe it wasn't from that six pack. And then throughout the course of the note taking and form filling and investigation, it was just connected to the beer that she had bought and maybe it actually wasn't yeah it's possible I, i'm really not sure what to make of that about about that piece of evidence and i did want to mention brianna maitland's disappearance as well um only in that the picture of sarah's car kind of reminded me of the picture of brianna maitland's car of course that was found quite a distance away in montgomery vermont still the same state um, and her vehicle, Brianna's vehicle, was found sort of crashed into an abandoned house. Um, I think it seems pretty likely that that was Brianna trying to get out of a situation uh, when she drove that car into the house. And in Sarah's case, with her car, it seems like the, the killer uh, placed that car there. Is that the same thought that you have? Oh, absolutely. I don't believe that this was some way that Sarah was trying to get away from something because it's the exact opposite of what she should have been doing. Uh, with Brianna's case, if you just look at the dynamics of how her car was backed into that building, there's only like one conclusion you can confidently come to, which is that she was backing up so that she could make maybe a two-point turn to get out of that area and happened to hang herself up on the foundation of the house. Uh, with this, there's no escape from that car. Sarah would have been pulling herself into a enclosed area where she wasn't able to probably get out of the driver's side window with the amount of space that wasn't there. Yeah, I wish we had a better photograph to see really how much room there is there to, to sneak out of that window, but it definitely doesn't look like much. Very strange. In the years after her death, Sarah was honored by an annual youth golf clinic in Manchester, which is a really beautiful thing to do. It's a free golf clinic for youths 8 to 16 years old. And in 1990, the fourth anniversary of the clinic, 245 youths attended and received instruction along with a gift bag of golf items, which, again, is a really memorable thing to do in honor of such a Again, passionate, driven individual who met a tragic, untimely end. And there's also a Sarah Hunter Spring Classic Tournament that's held at the Manchester Country Club. Yeah, that's very cool. They just celebrated their 34th year of hosting this Sarah Hunter Spring Classic. So a very nice way to honor her memory. And if you have any information on Sarah's murder, you are instructed to contact Captain Dunlap at the Vermont State Police Major Crime Unit. The number there is 802-244-8781. And you may also submit an anonymous tip by going to vsp.vermont.gov slash tip submit or by texting keyword VTIPS to 274637.